If we combine the cost of living crisis, soaring interest rates and sky high prices, it seems as if the UK housing market is set up for a big crash. So in this video, we're going to look at the reasons for that and against it, but we'll also end with some forecasts for UK house prices, including one from me. If you do enjoy our videos, remember, please do subscribe to our channel and like this video. So let's look at UK house prices in a bit more detail. Now, house prices have been falling year on year for a while now, but what's interesting is that if you look at asking prices, many people would choosing to keep the house off the market rather than reduce the asking price. However, this data from Rightmove shows that that's actually changed now. And that shows that we're kind of later into the falling market at the point at which people start to capitulate and say, yes, I'm not gonna be able to sell my house unless I lower the price. Now it's not a big fall, we've only fallen by about 1.9% over the course of one month. But still, I think that shows the weakness of the UK property market right now. And if we zoom in on the map, you can see the monthly changes, those are shown in orange, and you can see the yearly changes, those are shown in green. And what's noticeable is that year on year, we still haven't moved down much. In many cases, we're still moving up. It's the monthly changes in asking prices which is showing that softness. So it does seem to be the new trend that people are simply willing to sell their house for less now. If we look at the nationwide house price survey, which is the largest one in the UK, you can see that currently house prices are falling by about 4% year on year. That comes off a period of very rapid increases after the pandemic. So if we do look at the average house price in the UK, you can see how much it's increased since 2020. It rose by about 27% and it's only fallen back by about 5%. So we're still over 20% higher than we were just a couple of years ago. If we compare this sell-off with previous episodes where house prices fell, again using that nationwide data, you can see that previous episodes were much larger and much longer lived the largest one being the one following the global financial crisis in 2008. That lasted for a period of about six and a half years, and the size of that fall peaked to trough was about 20%. Now that one was due to a recession induced by what happened after the financial crisis, and the previous episode was caused by higher interest rates. This was in the 1990s, and that lasted just five years, and it was much smaller. It was only about 10% peak to trough falls. So this episode, by comparison, is quite brief so far and quite shallow. However, if we do adjust for inflation, the picture changes quite a lot. So what you can see here is the average house price in the UK, but adjusted for CPI inflation using today's money. So if we look at house prices in 2000, for example, it's adjusted for inflation between 2000 and the current time. Now, currently, the average house price in the UK is about £261,000. However, if we go back to 2004, house prices were actually a little bit higher at that point. It was £264,000 in today's money. So really, if you're thinking about buying houses as an investment, you must always compare with inflation over the period where you're calculating returns. And in the UK, partly because we've had very poor wage growth, the real growth of house prices has pretty much stalled for the past 20 years. And the recent fall you can see in this graph is not because house prices have been falling sharply, but because inflation has been so high recently. Now, if we look at the peak to trough falls again in the light of this inflation adjusted measure of house prices, you can see it makes the falls much more extreme, but also longer lasting. So the fall following the financial crisis is now deeper, it's about 27%, and the recovery time's much longer, it's about 15 years. And just as the market was recovering in real terms, you can see that's when we got the big spike in inflation after COVID. The fall in the 90s as well looks more extreme and longer, so instead of being around 10%, that's now around 20%, and it took about seven years to recover. So the recent fall since the pandemic looks much larger. Instead of about 5%, that doubles to around 12.1%. Now, the big negative factor for the UK housing market and markets elsewhere is rising mortgage costs. And indirectly, that's because of very high inflation in the UK. The Bank of England had to raise its policy rate to fight inflation. Here you can see the headline number, which includes all items, 
and you can also see the core number in yellow. That strips out the volatile components like food and energy and it's primarily driven by wages. And because wage growth in the UK has been pretty brisk and we're very much a service driven economy, this is really important for the Bank of England because this gives them a steer as to where inflation will be in future. And while headline inflation has been dragged down by energy falling, it's not the case that that's also pulling down core inflation. This means that the Bank of England is likely going to have to keep rates higher for longer in order to combat this very sticky core inflation. If we look at the Bank of England's policy rate going back to 1980, you can see the very aggressive increases we've had recently, which have come off the back of zero interest rates for a very long time. But really all that's done is to put us back into the normal range for the Bank of England's bank rate. 5.2% may seem extreme by recent historical standards, but if we look back further, it's actually quite normal. Furthermore, when the Bank of England finally conquers inflation, it's unlikely we'll go back to zero interest rates. It'll much more likely be something around 3% or maybe even 4% when that normal world comes back. But if we look at actual mortgage rates, and here are the two-year fixed rates for UK mortgages, depending on how much of the value of the house you borrow, the larger the loan to value, or LTV, ranging from 60% up to 95%, the greater the rate you'll have to pay. And that's because it's a bigger risk to the bank if you've borrowed more, because if you default on your payments, then they're going to take a bigger hit. So currently we're looking at people fixing over a two year period for costs of between 6.2 and 6.9%. That's a completely different world from the one we were in just a few years ago. Now you can see the importance of macroeconomics on the housing market, but it also affects your investments. And that's a topic we discuss all the time in our weekly market roundup. It's absolutely free. It's often amusing. We try to keep it very punchy and short, and it comes into your inbox every Friday. We won't send you spam. So if you are interested in learning more about that and you want to sign up for it, then just click in the link in the description beneath me or the link beside me to learn more. However, a large part of the UK housing market is rate insensitive. If we break down UK households into whether they rent or whether they buy, and we break down the buyers into those with mortgages or those who own outright, what's quite shocking is that for the UK, about a third of households own their houses outright. Now, many of these people are probably older people who've paid off their mortgage and benefited from that period of zero interest rates. In fact, there are more of those who own outright than those who have mortgages. About 33% own outright versus 30% with mortgages. So for those 8.1 million lucky people who own their own house, they're pretty much rate insensitive. If anything, they probably want rates to be higher because these are savers and they'll get a higher rate on their savings. But this is why higher interest rates don't necessarily mean a catastrophe for the UK housing market. For a large proportion of the market, people are rate insensitive. Now you've probably heard the Bank of England say that monetary policy operates with a lag. Well, the lag is now longer, and that's because more of us now fix our mortgages for some period of time. If we compare with 2011, you can see the percentage of mortgages which are floating rate, which just adjust with the Bank of England's rate. Those only make up just over 10% of mortgages, whereas about two thirds of mortgages are now fixed for more than two years. That means that if the Bank of England increases interest rates, it'll take a while for those mortgage fixed terms to come to an end and for those people to have to refinance their mortgages and pick up the higher rate. In other words, the pain from higher interest rates hasn't finished dragging down prices yet. It'll take a while. Now, I don't usually talk about politics, but in this case, I feel quite strongly that government policy for all governments so far has been broken. Solutions like help to buy, where the government stepped in to provide equity loans for first-time buyers, in many cases that simply served to pump up the market, particularly in London. So you can see on this graph from the FT, when the equity loan was raised to 40% for houses that were bought in the capital, almost immediately the house prices that were affected surged upwards. So really all this did was to pump up prices. Did this make it more affordable for people to buy in the capital? Well, you can see clearly it did exactly the opposite. 
And then when the scheme is withdrawn, which it was, you're left with a house with very little equity and very high valuation. And if prices fall, you're very easily going to fall into negative equity. So really, this is a governmental pump and dump scheme, which in many cases did not help people, particularly in the capital. Elsewhere, it did increase the supply of housing. But there's one group of people who definitely benefited from this help to buy scheme, and that's house builders. When help to buy was introduced in 2013, you can see the effect on house builder profits. They have surged since that introduction. And as a result of these help to buy schemes, but also the period of zero interest rates, which lasted a decade, far too long, I think, that's inflated house prices, and it's essentially locked the vast majority of people out of the housing market unless you're one of the people who are lucky enough to have a rich mummy or daddy who can help you out with a deposit. So really all this is going to do is to further entrench the massive wealth inequality which we have here in the UK. So here you can see the deciles for households in the UK broken down by wealth. So there are 10 deciles ranked by poorest at the bottom to richest at the top. And the wealth of the household is broken down into four categories. We've got private pensions, so this is like financial wealth. We've got net property wealth. This is the value of the property minus the mortgage. We've got physical wealth, which is things like jewellery, but also cars. And then we've got net financial wealth, which is investment wealth. Now for the middle categories of wealth, it's dominated by property wealth. These are people who got onto the housing ladder perhaps 10 years ago and who've done very well from it. Then at the top of the wealth distribution, you can see that wealth is much more evenly spread between financial wealth, physical wealth, and property wealth, but also pension wealth. Now, these people at the top of the wealth distribution are in a position to help the next generation, their children, to get into the housing market. But for everybody else who've got very little wealth in total, you can see that for the typical person between the fifth and sixth decile, the wealth is much, much smaller it's much harder to build up a deposit and get into the housing market. Now, one thing that people talk about when it comes to fixing the housing market in the UK is the undersupply of housing. And there's this great report, which is from the House of Commons Library. And if we look at this summary at the top of the document, you can see the supply that the government aimed to have. That's 300,000 houses per year. That's the dashed line you can see here. Well, the government's failed to meet that target. The actual number of houses which have been produced is the green line, which falls well short of that target. If we look at the history of UK housing supply, you can see how it's changed over time. The purple zones here are the amount of houses produced by local authorities. So in the big post-war building programmes, you can see that they really dominated the new supply. However, after about 1978, that dwindled to a trickle, and now it's almost non-existent. Nowadays, it's private enterprise, essentially an oligopoly with just eight big companies, which provides most of the supply. Now, it's not in their interest to increase the supply a lot and to push down house prices. They'd much rather have large margins and keep the supply limited. So I don't think there are any easy solutions to fixing the UK housing market. But what's pretty clear is that house prices are simply too high. They've got to come down in order to make it more affordable for the average person with the average wage to be able to afford to buy a house. Until that happens, the current bank of mum and dad deposits are just going to increase wealth inequality. So now let's turn to the forecast for the UK housing market. The most important drivers, I think, are four factors. The two in red, which you can see here, push down prices, and the two which are in green push up prices. So currently high interest rates are pushing down prices. That's definitely having a chilling effect. And of course, affordability is a problem. The average house is about six and a half times the average income. That's not far off an all-time record of around seven that we've just come off. So affordability is going to reduce the number of people who can afford a house, and that's going to reduce demand. However, at the same time in the UK, for the reasons we've discussed, planning permission being one of them for new houses, there's a lack of supply. Now, what we have seen in the UK, which is encouraging, is wage growth has picked up. We had a decade of no real wage growth, but recently wage growth has really accelerated. And in fact, it's almost beating inflation, despite inflation being so high. 
So that's definitely going to help the housing market. That's because if your wage is increasing, you can afford to buy a more expensive house. So bear in mind those factors as we go through these forecasts. The Office for Budget Responsibility in the UK comes up with a house price forecast and they think that it'll only fall peak to trough by 10%. But notice side by side with that is what they thought would happen to mortgage rates. Since they made their forecast, which was in March of this year, the bank rate forecasts have gone up and so have the peak mortgage rates. So if they were to revise this, which they will in autumn, then we'll see what happens to their forecast. But almost certainly they're going to have a bigger dip in house prices as a result of higher mortgage rates. Now we're already 5% down from the peak in 2023. So by this forecast, we've only got 5% to go. But let's see how they revise it later this year. Halifax also produces a forecast and what they expect is a fairly shallow fall but quite an extended one which lasts into next year. They think that the average property price will still be about £45,000 above its pre-Covid amount. If we superimpose that estimate on historic house prices according to their index you can see that it's not much of a fall at all. In fact, we're already flirting with levels which are about 45k above the pre-pandemic levels. So certainly not a crash, according to the Halifax. The estate agent Savills produces a kind of weather chart, which I really like. And this shows whether it's going to be rainy, house prices will fall, or whether it's going to be sunny and house prices will rise. And they've broken it down by region. So for the UK as a whole in 2023, they expect a 10% fall. Again, very close to the OBR's estimate and also to what the Halifax was saying. So we're about halfway into that fall already. Then in 2024, a very modest rise. And then it accelerates until we get into 2026 and 2027, when we see rates of growth of around 7% per year, which are very brisk. So far from a crash again, more of a weak period followed by very rapid growth following that. So I said I'd come up with a forecast myself. This is probably how I'd approach it. And it needs a little bit of thought to understand this graph, so bear with me. What we've got here on the x-axis is interest rates. So this is the Bank of England bank rate, going from very low rates on the far left of the graph to very high rates on the right-hand side of the graph. Then on the y-axis, we've got the expensiveness of the UK housing market as measured by the price to income ratio. This is how many pounds you pay for a house relative to the number of pounds you earn. Now recently we've been very close to an all-time high of seven times earnings. So you can see in September 2022 was probably the peak in the price to income ratio for the UK. Currently we're below that due to the house price falls but not by much because house prices haven't fallen much. The dashed yellow line which you can see is where the current bank rate is from the Bank of England. That's five and a quarter percent. Now you can see that that's just on the cusp of causing something called a derating. If the bank rate increases a little bit from where it is now, historically people have paid a lot less for their houses. It's become much cheaper, the housing stock in the UK. So when bank rate was about 6% in 2000 and 1988, you can see people were only willing to pay four times their income for the average house. So if we do go from 6.5 times price to income to four times, that would be a pretty chunky fall of around 40%. But I don't think that's likely to happen because of the fact that we've got so many fixed mortgages now and probably the rate's going to come down by the time many of those fixes happen. Also, remember, we've got a big rate insensitive part of the market in the UK. So that'll mitigate the effects of higher interest rates. Now for members, we've also got a forecasting model for UK house prices, one for the US as well. And what that does is to extrapolate the income for the UK with a price to income ratio, with a central case, a best case and a worst case. And currently the central case is for very, very slow growth of about 2% for the UK housing market. But bear in mind, this doesn't know about interest rates. All it can see is wage growth, which is accelerated, and price to income ratios, which are elevated. But the pessimistic case for the model is for a 6% year on year fall. What is pretty clear is that there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen with price to income values. Will they continue surging upwards? 
or will they start to normalise to more historic norms? So you can see that many of these models, including ours, are not predicting a big crash for the housing market. That's because there are still lots of positive factors. Unemployment remains very low by historic standards. Wage growth has accelerated in the UK, which is pushing up inflation, but it's also supporting the housing market. And of course, we've got limited supply, not always for good reasons, but that also tends to bolster prices. So I don't think there's going to be a crash in the UK market, despite a lot of breathless YouTubers saying that's going to be the case. It gets clicks, but it's probably wrong. And don't forget, if you do enjoy our content, why not get our free weekly market roundup? And there'll be instructions on how to do that in the link in the description beneath me. And as always, thank you for listening.